You'll always notice that in a church, is that front and center is, is never full. Yeah. The funny thing was, though, on Easter, because it was so full, when people came in late, they had to do the walk of shame all the way to the front so everybody could see them coming in 15 minutes after service started. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. All right, before we start, it was suggested to me by somebody that before we move on, we have one Tuesday night where I review everything we've gone over and open it up for questions so that people have like a week to come up with any questions they might have. Who thinks this is a good idea? One, two, that was a half. Matt doesn't seem to need it. Carlos thinks it's a good idea. All right. All right. So, Matt, you can take a week off next week. <laughs> well, I don't know. We're, we're going to be spending a few weeks in Chapter 6. I'm not sure I want to divide that up. We're doing chapter, all of Chapter 5, one night, Chapter 5. We did chapter four in two weeks, chapter five in one week, and now we're going to park in chapter six for like two or three months. We go, big cat. All right, welcome everybody on this beautifully warm spring day. I'm ready for fall. Tonight we are in Genesis chapter five, where we read. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahal Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hand. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The word of God. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, I thank you for tonight. I, I thank you, first, Lord, for a beautiful day, Lord, that your glory shines through. The beauty of spring, Lord, just never ceases to amaze me. So I thank you that you are always giving us reminders, Lord, of who you are. The very creation reminds us of who you are, God. And I thank you for your word. I think that your word, like nothing else, Lord, instructs us in who you are, Lord, and reveals to us what you have us know about you. So, God, I pray that as we go to your word tonight, uh, and we see a passage we've probably all read 
so many times in our life, Lord, and just read a bunch of names and numbers, Lord, that we could see what it is you're revealing about yourself in this, Lord, and about us. So I just pray, God, that you would open our minds, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, Lord, and reveal who you are. We love you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, so last week we began discussing the two lines that came from Adam, and we focused on the line of Cain. We said that Moses provided information for the first seven generations of Cain's line to represent the whole line, and we saw how sin had proliferated generation after generation through that line. Now this week we're going to consider the other line that comes from Adam. That's the line of Seth. And this is the only other line. This is what the Bible makes clear from Genesis 3.15 on. There are only two types of people. There are those who are saved and those that are not. There's the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There are the elect and there are the reprobate. And while we're tracing physical lines here in Genesis, I mentioned last week that Moses is using these to represent spiritual lines. The line of faith, represented by Seth, who called upon the name of the Lord. And the line of spiritual faithlessness, represented by the line of Cain, who made his own city and called it after the name of his own progeny. And we also saw that for the most part, only one son is named for each generation, the exception in Cain's line of the three sons of Lamech, who were the last generation named in that line. And this is meant to draw a parallel because the line of Seth will end with the three sons of Noah. And we'll see in the coming weeks that not all three sons of Noah are of the line of faith. And what that means for all the other sons and daughters that are mentioned in the line of Seth, we don't really know. That's the point. Moses is using a single physical line of descendants as a type of the spiritual line of descendants. But within that physical line, some of whom we'll see are not spiritual descendants, in that physical line is the spiritual line of descendants. The spiritual people are contained within the physical line. And that's another point Moses is making. Because when Moses wrote this, physical Israel, national Israel, they had already been saved and called as a whole into the promised land. It's likely, by the time that this was written, that the majority of an entire generation of Israelites have already shown themselves to not be of the spiritual descendants. So Moses is making a very important distinction. And Understanding this distinction is essential to understanding the redemptive history of the entire Bible. The spiritual children are contained within the physical progeny. Now, this will play out in the line of Noah. It will play out in the line of Abraham. It will play out in the line of Isaac. It will play out in the line of Jacob. It will play out in physical Israel, most of whom are actually judged in the Old Testament and shown not to be of the spiritual line. It plays out in the remnant that are returned from the land of Babylon. It reaches its consummation in Christ the spiritual offspring of the woman who comes from the physical offspring of a nation of Israel. And now, spiritually, it plays out in the church. The church who Paul calls the Israel of God, calls us the true sons of Abraham. He calls us the children of promise. So, keep in mind what the line of Seth represents. It's the line of faith. The, the people we're talking about here are our brothers in Christ. These are the offspring of the woman, as opposed to those in the line of Cain that were the offspring of the serpent. As I mentioned last week, we get much more detail in Moses' description of the line of Seth than we did with the line of Cain. Remember, we were given no information other than simply the names of the men in that line. No real details of their lives except for Lamech, with whom sin reaches new heights. But here in the line of Seth, we get more detail. And the details show this is the line that is really carrying out the creation mandate. They are being fruitful and multiplying. Because remember, that's not just a physical mandate. It is spiritual. It is supposed to be imagers of God that are spread over the whole earth. Obedient followers of God. Children of God. And that's why this next major section of the book begins like it does. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered his son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. First, let's note how this section of the book begins. This is the book of the generations of Adam. This is the second major section of the book. This is the book of the Toledoth of Adam. Moses is signaling a new section of Genesis. We just finished the Toledoth of the heavens and the earth. We saw the creation of everything, including mankind. We saw through the generations, creation was corrupted, including mankind. And that section ended, if you remember, with the hope of Eve in God's promise. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called him Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So that section ends with the hope that this child is the promised offspring of the woman. 
and it's like when Cain was born, that Eve expresses her hope in the offspring that is to come, shows that she had faith in God. She had faith that his promise is going to be fulfilled. This is faith in Christ. And then the new section begins, and it focuses in on Adam. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. This is reminding us that the image and likeness of God in which man was originally created is that same image that was corrupted through sin and became more and more corrupted in the line of Cain. But now as we reset with, with the line of Seth, we're reminded that mankind was made in the likeness of God. And there's actually a play on words here in our English translations, probably not intentional, because the word for Adam and man are actually the same word in the Hebrew. It's the word Adam, where we get the name Adam from. This says, this is the Toledoth of Adam. When God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them Adam when they were created. So we see here how the man Adam is really representative of the whole human race. He was Adam, but we're told here together he and Eve were both Adam. So the word refers to both the individual man and the race as a whole. And the focus here is on the individual man because we're told when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So after we have the reminder that Adam, the man, was made in the likeness of God, we're told that Adam had a son in his own likeness after his image. Moses is drawing a line from God to Adam to Seth in doing this. Remember, we saw the last section ended with the fact that Seth and or his posterity called upon the name of the Lord. So we're seeing descriptions here that from God through Adam to Seth, this is the line of offspring that have faith in God. And the use of image and likeness terminology and the fact that we're told that God created male and female and the fact that we're told that he blessed them this is supposed to draw our minds back to the creation mandate. We read this a few times already. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what we see in the birth of Seth is the beginning of the true fulfillment of this creation mandate. This is Adam and Eve being fruitful and multiplying by creating an imager of God. And this genealogy now shows how this was carried out through the line of Seth as opposed to the evil line of Cain. And as I've stressed, this is a spiritual line in focus. It's a line of believers. And like I said, this carries through the whole history of redemption, including, as I just explained, the line of Israel. The spiritual line was contained within that physical line, just like here, the spiritual lines contained in the physical line of Adam. And as I said, the creation mandate that is in this chapter being fulfilled, it's the same mandate that God's people have always had and always will have, and that includes us as the church. And this is really what Christ tells his disciples right before his ascension. In Acts 1, we read, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now note, Jesus' answer to the question of the disciples is about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, the true spiritual Israel. They ask, are you about to restore the kingdom? And though Jesus tells them and us that the timing of that's not for us to know, his answer is really yes. He is going to restore the kingdom of Israel through the church fulfilling the creation mandate and the power of the Spirit. And if you read the book of Acts with this in mind, you find that this is exactly what happens in the early church. They start in Jerusalem, and in Acts 6, we read, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Notice the language of the creation mandate that Luke uses to describe the spreading of the gospel in Jerusalem. There is increase, there is multiplication. He used the same language for the spreading of the gospel, according to Christ's command, in Judea and Samaria. In Acts 9, we read, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Right before the Gentile mission begins, we read that the word of God increased and multiplied. When we read of a Gentile mission by the Apostle Paul, we're told the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. We actually see the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply by filling the earth with images of God is carried out in the book of Acts. It's carried out within the church according to Christ's command. This is what we're still doing as the church. This is parallel to what we see Moses describing in Genesis 5. 
When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And as I said, the spiritual line is contained within the physical line. The spiritual seed of the woman comes from the physical seed of the woman. So we're told with Seth that he is made in Adam's likeness and after his image. But we're also told the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. We have Seth in Adam's image and likeness and these other sons and daughters. Does this mean none of the other sons and daughters of Adam are saved? No, it's not what this means. But that's utterly irrelevant. Moses is painting a picture for Israel of the spiritual seed that will come from the physical seed. Believe me, none of the Israelites thought the people of Edom were part of a spiritual seed of God. And yet, they were the physical seed of Abraham and Isaac. Right? And that's the point. They were sons of Abraham. They were physical sons of Abraham. They were literally of the physical seed, but they were not spiritual sons of Abraham. See, Israel had to understand that being the physical seed doesn't mean a thing. Moses wanted to ensure that they were part of a spiritual seed, just like us. Moses wanted to make sure they made their calling and election sure. And that, of course, comes from the book of 2 Peter, where Peter says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of a divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. This just as easily could have been Adam's advice to Seth. This was Moses' advice to Israel. Because from the very beginning, being part of the spiritual people of God is all that mattered. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Adam, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So there's two things to note here. Note first the words, and he died. Now remember, when God promised death to Adam, if he should eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was promising spiritual death. And of course, through faith in Christ, whether it's today on this side of the cross, or in the days of Seth, looking forward to the promised offspring that was to come, through faith in Christ, we are saved from spiritual death. But there were still further consequences for sin. Right? These are the consequences that were pronounced, the curses that were pronounced, after the promise of Genesis 3.15. And the fact that it comes after is significant. Because the promise of eternal life, for those who believe in the one who would undo what Adam did, that stands no matter what. But there are still consequences for sin. We saw God curse Adam and say, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. Physical death is a consequence of sin that even those saved from spiritual death have to pay unless Christ is to return. So Moses is sure to point that out. What God promised Adam happens. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And we'll see this reframe throughout this genealogy. And we'll see this throughout the Old Testament. We'll see, even as we go through Genesis, that the lifespans of humans become shorter and shorter because as sin becomes more ubiquitous, so does death. The second thing I want us to notice is that Adam had Seth at 130 years old and then lived another 800 years, which means he died, as we see here, at 930 years old. Now, the ages listed in this genealogy we address in the very first study in the introduction to the book. And I showed you that the Bible does indeed skip generations in places, very obviously. We have here ten generations from Adam to Noah, leading to the flood. We'll see later in Genesis 11, we have ten generations from Shem after the flood to Abraham. So Moses very well could be using the number ten on either side of the flood to represent a full or complete line. Just like he did with the number seven on Cain's side. We also saw that the Bible, including other places in Genesis very obviously changes the ages of some people for theological purposes. We also touched on how the Masoretic texts that our English translations are based on for the most part have different ages 
for a lot of these men in Genesis 5 than the Greek Old Testament does or the Samaritan Old Testament does. We also discussed how in a lot of ancient writings, the lifespans of significant men would be exaggerated so that history would show them as these great, long-living warriors. In some ancient writings, like the Sumerian king list, men are said to have lived for over 40,000 years. Now, if you're a nerd and you like to read, I've printed some resources out up here. There's three different articles there if you want to take them home. If you're not a nerd, it'll help you get to sleep tonight, I promise. But I'm not going to spend any time here on the ages, because the ages aren't the point. The spiritual lineage is the point. So maybe generations are skipped. I think they are. Does that change anything? No. Because as I mentioned in the introduction, generations, many of them, are skipped in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. Does that change anything? This wasn't an uncommon uh, uh, means of writing back then. It, it just goes to show that genealogies, even those of Jesus, have a spiritual purpose in the Bible. In fact, if you compare the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, you'll see that Matthew lists 41 generations from Abraham to Jesus, and Luke lists 57. And it's not even only that Matthew skips generations. He does. But if you read carefully, you'll notice that genealogies between these two gospel accounts diverge and then come back in multiple places. So it's not, as some suggest, that Luke traces Mary's line and not Joseph's. That's absolutely not true. Not only do both clearly claim to be tracing Joseph's line, but the genealogies that diverge after David, come back together for two generations, diverge again, come back again at Joseph. Why? How, how can this be possible? These guys didn't have more than one father. Well, the physical genealogy is not the point. It's the spiritual that matters. And the man Jesus is physically the son of David, the son of Judah, the son of Israel, the son of Abraham, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. But he is spiritually the son of David, the son of Judah, the son of Israel, the son of Abraham, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and the son of God. But even if Moses here skips generations, and even if Moses plays with the ages for a theological reason I can't figure out, what doesn't change is that in ancient genealogies, even the ones that talk about kings who reigned for 40,000 years, the people named in these genealogies actually existed. The writer's always writing of real men, even if the lifespans were exaggerated. So the existence of the men mentioned in this line, as far as Moses was concerned, these were real people. He, he's trying to communicate historical fact that these men existed. And so he gives us, in this line, the same formula for all the generations. He'll say how long the man lived, who he fathered, how long after he fathered him he lived. He mentions he had other sons and daughters. And then he tells us how old he was when he died. And trust me, the math is correct on every single one. I did it. You don't got to do the math. It's all right. So we have the genealogy. When Seth lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared lived 152 years, he fathered Enoch. Stop. Because we see here, unlike the brief genealogy we were given in Cain, Moses gives details of the being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth according to the creation mandate in Seth's line. There are seven generations of multiple sons and daughters. All right? And he's sure to point out that every man through the first six generations died. And he died. It ends every single one. And I stopped here because we're about to take a little excursus here from the straight formula. We're going to get some more details regarding this generation. We have seven generations. Enoch is the seventh from Adam. And we have a parallel here. We got a list of the line of Cain up until the seventh generation from Adam when we got to Lamech. And remember we read... I went too far. Hold on. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And we saw that by this seventh generation, man had moved further and further from God and was now actually celebrating sin. And even though he sinned, he didn't believe there'd even be any repercussions for that sin. And we saw that seven was significant because it's a literary device meant to present Lamech as a representation of the whole line of the reprobate. Well, Moses is doing the same thing here with the seventh generation of the elect. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. 
Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And as he was not, for God took him in Israelite tradition means that Enoch was taken bodily to heaven without seeing death. He then, according to the tradition, becomes part of a divine council and actually got the job of being the one who had to deliver news of judgment to heavenly beings that rebelled against God at the second divine rebellion. We see this reflected in the apocryphal book of Enoch. We're reading Enoch 12. Before these words were spoken, Enoch was taken, and nobody knew where he was taken and where he is now and what happened to him. His words were with the watchmen, that would be the heavenly beings that were part of the divine council, and his days were with the holy ones. And standing there, I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of greatness, the king of the ages, and behold, the watchmen of the holy great one called me. Enoch, scribe of righteousness, go and speak to the watchmen of heaven. Any who left behind the high heavens, the holy eternal place, who were defiled with the women, and just as the sons of the earth did, they did the same also, and took for themselves women. You have brought great destruction on the earth, and there will be no peace for you, no remission for sin, and though they rejoice at their children, they will see the murder of their beloved ones, and they will groan over the destruction of their children. They will be bound forever, and there will be for them no mercy and peace. Now we're going to dig into this much deeper when we get into Genesis 6. The question is, is the tradition true? Well, we can turn to the pages of the New Testament and read more about Enoch. Like in the book of Hebrews, where we read, By faith, Enoch was taken up so he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So, Israelites' idea of what happened to Enoch is true as far as him going to heaven. Enoch walked with God every father Methuselah 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. But I want to notice two things here. First, note that Enoch lived for 365 years. And as some suggest, this has absolutely nothing to do with the days in a year, because when Moses wrote this, the Jewish calendar did not even have 365 days in a year. What I want us to notice is that his time on earth, even though he is commended as the one walking with God, he is commended as the one pleasing God, his lifespan is much shorter than anyone else in his genealogy. Yet we consider him the most blessed of the bunch. Why is that? Well, I think the point Moses is making is that walking with God and being with him is far greater than just living long lives on earth. The greatest blessing is not long life. The greatest blessing is a close relationship with God. Second, we're told that Enoch walked with God. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that he was the only one in the line who was saved, right? This is the spiritual line of the elect here. It means he had a special relationship with God. The only other place we've read anything about man and God walking together was in the garden, right? Where the presence of God dwelt, where heaven met earth. God dwelt there, walked with Adam, right? So there was an intimate relationship being talked about there. Well, see, others in the book of Genesis are said to walk with God. Noah walks with God. Abraham and Isaac are said to walk with God. We're told in the book of Leviticus that the greatest blessing for obedience would be this. God says, and I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. See, walking with God is reserved only for those who God chooses and who obey him. So we see the electing love of God at work in the line of Seth. But there's more, like Adam who is the other person we've seen walk with God, or like Noah, who we'll see is the next person to walk with God. The idea of walking with God, not just walking before God, but walking with God, has a prophetic overtone to it. Like Adam, the first prophet, who was tasked to speak forth the word of God to his wife and to his posterity. Like Noah, who is the next Adam, as it were, through whom God recreates humanity. Enoch was also a prophet called to speak forth the word of God. And while the book of Enoch, well, both books of Enoch actually are apocryphal, and written around the time of Jesus, most likely, and are not part of the canon as far as most Christians are concerned, I want us to just look at one more prophecy in the book of Enoch. At the outset of the book of First Enoch, Enoch, we read this. About the elect ones I speak now, and concerning them I take up my proverb. My holy great one will come out from his dwelling place, and the God of the angels will walk upon the earth, upon Mount Sinai. He will appear from his encampment and shine forth in the strength of his power from the heaven of heavens. All will be afraid, and the watchmen will believe. They will sing, hidden in all the high places of the earth. 
and all the high places of the earth will shake. Trembling and great fear will take them unto the end of the earth, and they will shake and fall. The lofty mountains shall break up, and the high hills will be humbled and slipped to the mountains. They will melt like beeswax from the face of the flaming fire. And the earth will be divided, a division like grapes. As much as is upon the earth will destroy itself, and judgment will be against everyone. With the just he will make peace, and upon the elect it will be preservation and peace. Upon them mercy will come, and they shall belong to God. He shall give approval to them, and will bless them all. He will help them all and help us. Light will shine on them, and he will make peace over them. For he comes with his ten thousands and his holy ones to enact judgment against all. He will destroy everyone who is ungodly and reproach all flesh concerning all works of the ungodly. The things they did impiously, the harsh words they spoke, and all that ungodly sinners spoke against him. So note here, in the beginning of the book of Enoch, we have a contrast between two types of people drawn. The elect, as Enoch calls them, who will receive the blessings of God. And then there are those who are ungodly who will be judged finally and forever for their sin. And it's relevant to what we're reading here in Genesis because that's exactly what's being contrasted here. The line of Seth is the elect, and the line of Cain is the reprobate who will pay for their sin. But I want to pay heed to this prophecy because even though it's not a canonical book, even though it's not inspired by the Holy Spirit, if any of that sounded familiar to you, it should, because part of it is actually quoted by a Holy Spirit-inspired writer of a canonical book. In Jude 14, Jude's speaking of false teachers, and he says it was about, also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Now, this doesn't mean that these are actually the words of Enoch. They're not. Or that even this portion of 1 Enoch is inspired by the Holy Spirit. See, Jude was just instrument, interested in communicating a point, and quoting this well-known text to his readers would have gotten his point across well enough. The point is, Enoch is seen as a figure that is rewarded with the very presence of God. And he is a figure that pronounces judgment on those who aren't elect. And here in Genesis, we see Moses drawing this distinction between the two lines, using the seventh from Adam on each side as a superlative example of the line. There's Lamech, a sinner and a murderer like Cain, and there's Enoch, a man who seeks God like Seth, and who is rewarded not with physical life, but with eternal life. Thus the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then the line continues, and it goes three generations further than Cain's line. Because again, both seven and ten are numbers of completion or fullness. So Moses is using these numbers as re representations of the full lines that were likely much larger than what we have here in Genesis. But Methuselah, that would be Enoch's son, had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. And again, we stop, because now we get to the 10th generation from Adam. We get to Lamech's son, different Lamech in the line of Cain. And again, we get more details. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. So note, we get to the 10th generation from Adam, and like in the 7th, we are reminded again that this is, in fact, a line of faith. We see here that Lamech has hope that Noah is the promised offspring of the woman. He refers to the curse that God pronounced on the ground back in Genesis 3 and says, Noah may be the one to relieve mankind of the curse. So like Adam and Eve, we see all the way down to Lamech and his son, there is faith. There is faith in the one that God promised in Genesis 3.15. There is faith in the one that God would send to undo all that man has done. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 770 years, and he died. And we're going to get a lot more detail about Noah in the coming chapters, as you probably suspect. So I'm just going to end with the last verse of this chapter where we read, After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So I just want to notice a few things. Just like the line of Cain, we end this line with an exception to the rule of the one son per generation. We end with three sons. If you remember the line of Cain, we read it ended with Lamech. He took two wives, the name of the one was Adam, the name of the other is Zillah. 
had aboard Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. We leave off that genealogy with three sons who are all known for their work, for what they did. We leave off Seth's genealogy with three sons, all of whom were known only because God saved them from destruction through no work of their own. And this doesn't mean that Noah had three sons the year he turned 500. This just means by the time he was 500, Noah had these three sons. And we'll find more about, out about them in the coming weeks as well. So this chapter 5 is now complete. The first part of this major section is complete. Moses has detailed two lines. The only two lines there ever have been and ever will be since sin entered the world. And we'll see in the coming chapters, the physical line of Cain ends, but the spiritual line of Cain lives on. Moses is going to make sure we understand this is a spiritual line of faithlessness that's in view. And it's going to be important for us as we go through the rest of the book. See, a foundation has been laid here. Because of sin, there is the line of Cain, and it's only because of God's salvation through faith that there is the line of Seth. And everyone from Noah to his sons, to Abraham, to the nation of Israel, to us, to everyone who's alive today, everyone is in one of these two lines. The line of Cain or the line of Seth? The line of Satan or the line of promise? The line of the elect or the line of the reprobate? It is what Moses wants Israel to have as their basis for understanding God and themselves before he enters into stories about judgment and recreation. And we need to see the same thing. There are only two types of people. That's the point here. Always have been, always will be. And it's a spiritual difference. Any questions? I'm going to say it all again. I don't want to say Mahalalel anymore. So my question is, uh, in verse number, verse number four, from three, when he says that Adam lived, lived 130, 130 years, and then he fathered his son in his own likeness, mm -hmm. and after his image. Uh, my question is, if Adam, I know that he says God created man in his likeness of God, but then, then he was taken out of the, the garden because of sin, mm -hmm. And so he was more or less, we can say, he was spiritual dead. Mm -hmm. So, so now, if he father, uh, if he father Seth in his likeness, wouldn't he be also have the same like spiritual death? Or no, because when when Moses goes back and and revisits this, made him in the likeness of God, male and female created him, blessed them, named them man when they were created. Moses is now talking about Adam's image of God before sin entered the world. And so he uses the same language to describe Seth. So he's drawing, he's trying to draw a line of faith from Adam down to Seth. Adam and Eve sinned, right? They were sentenced to spiritual death, but through faith in the promise of Genesis 3.15, they were saved. Their physical progeny, you have Cain who wasn't, and you have Seth who was. So it's showing its, its spiritual progeny in view here. Okay. So now, how does it apply to, I believe, is 1 Corinthians? It talks about we one man, Adam, all die. Mm -hmm. And then how does it apply if he says through, because he says, I think he says through one man, Adam, all, we all, all die. But then I guess it's through Jesus Christ is where we are all alive. So how does that add, apply to or does it apply to this teaching that, that you uh, today? Because in our natural state when we're born, we are separated from God. We are under his wrath. We are deserving of spiritual death. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we are brought back into relationship with God and we are saved from spiritual death, right? That's the same way Adam was saved. So when Paul makes a comparison in Romans 5, he's, he's talking about death and sin coming into the world through the first sin and how by nature we're all children of wrath, but through Jesus Christ we're saved, okay? Mm -hmm. But Adam was subsequently saved. Adam and Eve were saved by faith, which you can see they had faith 
by hoping for the promised offspring of Genesis 3.15 with each kid. Antonio's got a little next car with questions on it. I could feel it. Well, I, you know, I'm not saying the ages can't be legit. I mean, you know, I've heard convincing arguments that they could be, but I don't think it's relevant. I don't think it matters. I don't think it changes anything. Take some of the reading material. You'll enjoy it. Can I take it somewhere else? So God comes back and we... Microphone, Jeffrey, what are you doing? You stand looking at him. Um, when God comes back and we do the thousand years, uh, are we all alive during that thousand years or we die and uh, come back? You know? <clears throat> it's not a literal thousand years. Go to the Revelation study, brother. I got a book you can read. <laughs> the, th the thousand years referenced in, in Revelation 20 are right now. The, re the reign of Christ is between his first advent and his second advent. For the 930 years that Adam lived, does well, that count like any time in the, in like the garden or is that separate? I, I would think it does. You know, we're not really, this is really the first time we're given any kind of even relative ages to anything, right? We don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before they sinned. We don't know how long they were out of the garden in Eden before they had Cain and Abel. We don't know how long it was. Obviously, Cain and Abel were older by the time Cain killed Abel. We don't know how long it was after that until they had Seth. So we just don't know. But I, I would assume it includes from the day of creation to the day they bore Seth would be 130 years, if it's literal years. But that's what's being communicated here. Rebuttal. Rebuttal. Matt's got something. <laughs> Matt, had his hand up. It would seem that there are. Hi there. <laughs> there could have been hundreds and hundreds of other children. Oh, yeah. Because to say that after Noah was 500 years, he fathered Shem, Ham, and Jake. That could, that, that could have been ch children 126, 7 and 8, or, yeah. or who knows, in between them. Right. There's no telling. We don't know. Because I'm thinking they didn't wait 500 years um, to have a child. That's a long time. I, I would say. And the whole line of the, the spiritual line I think we said this before. Um, that's what's explained to us in the New Testament, that it's not yes. Abraham's seeds. It's the seed, which mm -hmm. is faith. But I'm wondering how much of this, because it's pretty clear that God has the two lines here, if you study this book. And how much of this is taught in the synagogue? But there's two lines. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Well, I, I think they, they, I think they believe that they, the nation of Israel, the culmination of the line. Okay, the nation of Israel. Right. Which, which tribe? All of them. Good question. Well, according to the Bible, you know, all, there's still eleven tribes in exile, aren't there? Right. So. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. Could be a, a huge lack of clarity. Yeah, I mean, that, that's basically how the New Testament starts, right? John the Baptist telling the most religious Jews, I think your son's Abraham, 
God can raise up from these stones, son of Abraham. What did Jesus tell him? Same thing. If you were Abraham's son, you believe in me. You're, you're of your father, the devil. That's what Peter says, make your calling and election sure, right? There's a way to know. I, I don't buy that you can't know for yourself anyway, and, and I don't buy that you can't make a pretty good judgment on other people. Jesus himself said, you know, a, a good tree can't bring forth bad fruit or a bad tree good fruit, right? This, this isn't like this mystical, you know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, you don't, no one really knows who the elect are. Which tribe? <laughs> Dan. Not there. <laughs> Did you have something, Jeffrey? No. I uh, know. I was just thinking when he said, you know, um, which tribes or whatever, and the whole idea in, in Acts 2 where God's kind of starting to reclaim the nations mm -hmm. in a sense at Pentecost is kind of, you know, it just made me think of that. It's not really related to what he was saying. That's why I didn't say it. But you asked, so here we are. Well, yeah, and I guess if, you know, modern-day Jews would just read the book of Ephesians, this would settle the question, right? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that there have been, uh, Lord, giants of the faith that have studied these things and have um, talked about these things, Lord, that you preserve these things for us to stand on the shoulders of those that came before us that have taught these things. And Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, uh, that by your spirit we may be able to discern what is true, Lord, what uh, you would have us know and Honestly, God, just forget the rest. We just want to know you as you want us to know you, Lord. We want to know your word uh, for what it says and what it means, God. And we just want to be what you call us to be. So, Lord, just work in us by your spirit through your word today and every day. I pray in Jesus' mighty name.